very intense music and then very upbeat, happy, poppy music is what we're coming into. Rebecca Griffith, that's who she is. I'm Jim McKay. Uh, we're both physical therapists, but we're not talking about physical therapy stuff necessarily today. I feel like the stuff we're going to talk about is very applicable to um, people who transmit information in the style of presentation, which is fancy talk for saying people who give presentations. Yeah. Like this, this is a presentation. This is a presentation. So uh, we're doing this in the, in the style or the format of a six pack, which is we put down a prompt and the prompt is uh, six things you probably should do to have a great presentation. Six unmissable elements of a, capta a captivating presentation because we are uh, just a few fortnights. I actually don't even know how long a fortnight is. We're a few fortnights, I think, away from uh, our big physical therapy conference, which is combined sections meeting. And my big gripe there is, this is one of the hills I will die on, is is we are a brilliant profession. Um, but if it takes 17 years from, you know, publishing a, an article or a presentation or figuring something out, it takes 17 years for people to actually apply. That's an entire career. That's a shame. I think that is in the area of this is fancy talk for knowledge translation. I think there are simple, not necessarily easy, but simple things people can do to up their presentation game. I think we have brilliant people on stage and it breaks my heart to watch a presentation fall flat. The audience wants you to succeed. The audience is dying for good stuff. And I think the things uh, are simple that you could do in terms of making your presentation better. You do not need to be a TEDx speaker or a TED speaker or a graphic designer or Andrew Huberman or Joe Rogan. You don't need to be these things to just be a little better because the stuff you have in your brain could help the people sitting in front of you or on the other side of the screen. So we're going to bring just six little things, knowing that most of you aren't going to do it anyway, but the two <laughs> out of 100 who do, just employ one or two of these six things and you will substantially stand out above the crowd. How is that for an intro? I think that was a great intro. Thank you. So step one is be prepared. Have a great intro. No joke. This wasn't one of my six, uh, three things I was going to bring is I was told a great presentation. You tell people what you're about to tell them, tell them what you're there to tell them. And then you tell them what you just told them. We're big, dumb animals. We need reiteration, right? So one thing is plan out your stuff and then be very clear. And I am someone who loves to be cute, funny sayings, plays on words, Clear beats clever. Again, that's not even, that's a bonus thing. We haven't even gotten to the actual power six unmissable elements of a captivating presentation, but I'm already dropping nuggets. Or I'm trying. Can you tell I'm excited about this? I think you're pretty passionate about communication as a whole, yeah. I just see the opportunities. I remember sitting in rooms full of people of a thousand people and being like, man, if I had 1% of everybody's knowledge, we'd be unstoppable. And the only reason it doesn't come out is we get self-conscious when we present. Mm -hmm. We get nervous, maybe, you know, and we do this thing where I've got a month to go. I'll keep, I'll do my presentation tomorrow. I'll do it to tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. And then you never do it. Then we get the ha 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 present, present presenter gets up in front. We'll put this together, put the slides together on the flight in. And it's like, dude, did you really? I'm not saying yeah. you got your full dress rehearsal, but like, please tell me you did it more than 10 minutes before. I mean, I'm kind of guilty of sometimes doing that, but, but you speak regularly. Not your first rodeo. Yeah. Right. Have you ever been to a rodeo? Yeah. I mean, I live in Colorado. Oh. Is that a, it's is Nas that a National Western Stock Show month right now. Like, Obviously. rodeo all the time. Can't believe you mentioned it. Obviously, everybody knows that. Obviously. All right. So he, uh, I'm going to have ladies go first. So Rebecca Griffith, uh, what is your first element that you think people should use to have a captivating presentation? I think you need to understand that the slides are not your presentation. Oh, man, you went big first. I like I it. I know. And I actually think this is the easiest one, right? Like <laughs> the slides are not your presentation. You no. are the presentation. You're giving the knowledge. The slides are an adjunct visual aid. Like if you've ever watched a TED Talk, nobody's reading their slides. No. And your audience shouldn't be reading your slides either. So yes. I, when I make slides for presentation, there are times when I will put some words on them um, because I, I understand that if I want to learn something, sometimes I want to print out those slides. I want to be able to go back and reference them. Like if I'm going to see a patient and she's like, mm -hmm. well, what, what was that thing that she said in that presentation? I get that. That's what handouts are for though. 
Um, so if yes. you're making a slide, I like to put graphics on my slide that remind me what I'm going to talk about. Oh. And they like represent what I'm going to talk about so that you remember the images along with what I said. Oh. So your presentation, your slideshow, your slide deck, not your presentation. And to, for God's sake, don't read them. Oh, I mean, I could feel like we, if we just, if people just did that, we wouldn't have to have five more suggestions because all of that, um, you can use it as a cheat sheet. You can yeah. use it as a guidepost. Oh, when the slide with, I'm going to have a slide at CSM that has a dead raccoon on it. I bet you you've never been to a PT conference uh, presentation that has a dead raccoon just laying in the middle of a road, just a dead raccoon. But it makes sense. And it's going to make the, it's going to help the audience remember the thing I say that's not written on the screen of why the hell am I looking at the dead carcass of roadkill? Why is Rocky raccoon dead on the screen? And it's going to imprint on you. So the number one, slides are not your presentation. They flew you or you flew your ass all the way to CSF or somewhere to give a presentation. You could have emailed your slides. So, Right? Like if I, if I have your whole presentation on your what slides, do you, what do I need you for? Although I have had people, and I've made this offer, and I will make this offer again. If you are presenting at CSM for $0, I will review your presentation with you in a live stream and give you real feedback if you are open enough to do it give the presentation knowing it's a beta test right but i've had people email me their presentation their powerpoint and say can you help me with my presentation and i'm like i have no context this is not yeah. the presentation this is your slide deck you have to send me a video of you presenting this is where like words matter your presentation is how you present the information. If you're just sending me a PowerPoint, I will go as far as to say power. And I, th I think Steve Jobs said this. Someone fact check me. PowerPoint was the worst thing to ever happen to business <laughs> communication. He's like, because now we just gave people a little a binky and a blankie to hide behind instead of actually having to say things and make statements and be prepared. I'll just read through his lines. Yeah. So, so I will go as far as I have researched other places that show you not only this is bad, why this is bad. And I'll show you the, the um, exercise that I do when I coach people. You will be giving your presentation next to your slides, Rebecca. And there you are standing there in all your Rebecca-ness. Mm -hmm. All five foot three. Did I get that right? Five foot three. Five foot three of Rebecca-ness. And your slides are over to the slide. Uh, slide. The slides are over to the side. And they should be an accent. But what I do is a very sophisticated exer exercise with the flashlight on my cell phone. While Rebecca is, is speaking, I shine the flashlight at Rebecca. And when you change slides, I now shine the flashlight at the slide until I am damn, until I understand what the slide says. Because that's what our brain does. Mm. That's what our brain does. You give me new words to read. Since you learn to read, you cannot not read. Cannot not read. Yeah, you have to read. When you see words, your brain just starts reading them. You don't tell it to. It just starts reading them. So when you introduce words, our brain that knows how to read takes over, and we cannot do the reading and the listening at the same time. Can't really do it, right? Why do we turn the radio down when we're listening, looking, when we're thinking for directions? Oh, man. Because your brain can't dual task like that. So when you put those words up, I tell people all the time, you might as well just be saying nothing because I'm still processing the slide over here. So I don't care what you're doing. It You might as well just burn all those words. All those words are worthless. And it's not just until I'm done with the words because sometimes I don't get it and I got to read it again or you show me a graph that's poorly used and I'm like, wait, I'm trying to, what is she? And I'm doing this and you lost me before you had me. So you can tell your big first suggestion, I am a double thumbs up in agreement with it. And starting I strong. You, starting strong. And I bet you can't wait to see why I have a dead raccoon in no, I can't. Just lay in there, guts out. Maybe I should have a trigger warning. <laughs> I did not kill the raccoon. It was a stock image of a dead raccoon. All right, so that's your first one. Your slides are not your presentation. Fantastic. Um, I just told a story. So here's my first one. I just told the story about the flashlight. I told the story about a dead raccoon. I didn't read anything. We have nothing on the screen, right? We're live streaming and also sending this out via audio. I told a couple of little anecdotes, stories. I could have just told you stuff, but I framed it in a, this is what I've done, or I'm going to do this. And this plays on the principle of, my background was as a radio broadcaster. 
So you might think I was limited in what I could do and make you think and feel, except I actually think I could put pictures in your head. I actually could put a picture in your head right now, Rebecca. You're in Colorado. I'm in New York. And if I say, under no circumstances, do I want you to picture a pink elephant? Uh, 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 Uh-oh, uh-oh, there it is. Can't do it. Oh, you might have gotten rid of it really quickly. My point is, you can put things in people's heads just with words. And when you put them in the context of story, this thing in here, the brain, our human brain, we are wired for conversation. We avoid presentation, right? Because presentation typically is a lecture. But if you can string together a bunch of stories, we will listen to that. So I would say, hold on, because people are listening. I'm giving a very scientific talk. I can't just go up there and tell stories about elephants and dead raccoons and flashlight stories, Jimmy. I'm not telling you the whole thing needs to be Hansel and Gretel. This does not need to be a a, a script of a movie. I'm saying when you want to emphasize something, one of the tools in your toolbox, we love that analogy, picture the toolbox of all your clinical tools and your presentation tools. One of your tools could and needs to be put it in the context of a story. How could you do that? Just loosely off the, off the cuff, tell a story about a patient, tell a story about how you applied it. That will make it stick because the goal of you giving the presentation is not to have given the presentation and check off a box. The goal is to achieve understanding. The goal is to achieve the audience to actually understand what the hell it is you're up there saying. So my number one is a mix of you stories, but also understand and because your goal is to achieve understanding not to just rip through 63 slides in 11 minutes. That's not the goal. I'm sorry. Yes. An idiot could do that, but you're not an idiot. So don't be, give bad presentations. That's number one. I, I think the best analogy for that for physical therapists, right, is when we were in school, oh, yeah. was it was it the slides that were like about oh, the no. likelihood ratio or the special test or the position, or was it the cases that you got to go through about the patient? Look what you just did now. Remember when we were back in PT school? Boop, that's a story. You don't have to have a big, long, drawn out. And there we were, the summer of 1986. No, remember when you were in PT school? Yeah, I do. Like, that's powerful. It gives context. It gives authority. It gives a lot of things, actually, that we're going to talk about later on this list. All in one little trick. This is the stuff that we used to do around the campfire when we lived in caves or whatever. We are wired for stories. You're going to give a presentation. You're going to have your shirt buttoned up nice and the tie tight. You're still a human. It's everything. Also, one of my slides is two tin cans connected by a string. Remember, that's all you're really doing. You're taking information from one person and you're trying to put it through some sort of thing to get it to another human being. Story is a fantastic tool to use. It's not done enough in science. And I actually think it'd be even easier to do. It'd be even more powerful to do with science because we're all about people. Put it in context. So my number one is yours is your <laughs> slides are not your presentation. That's a hundred thousand percent true. Mine is uh, use a story and it doesn't need to be the whole damn thing, but interject a few stories. So that's my number one. What is your number two, which would be number three overall? My number two is consider your presentation to be more of a conversation ah. than a lecture. Okay. Because when people are lecturing at you, um, you might be focusing on taking notes. You might be trying to pick out things that they are saying. You don't really feel involved or engaged in it. I think it has a tendency to feel more like a fire hose. So Mm -hmm. if you are in this more conversational mode where I'm having a conversation with you, a few things happen. The first thing is I'm not as nervous because you and I are just having a conversation like Thousands of people could be watching right now. I don't know. This is a live stream, but you and I are just having a conversation about this. And that makes it less stressful for the presenter. Second, I think it makes it the audience feel more engaged. Oh, they're talking to me. This is important to me. I feel like I'm part of this this conversation. I feel like that person's connected with me. And when you think of it like a conversation too, you also have to read your audience cues. You have to change how your presentation is going. Like if you're at a party and you're talking to somebody and you start telling this really in-depth story about how grasshoppers hop because you find it fascinating, Mm -hmm. but they're yawning and they're looking over your shoulder and they're kind of like, God, my drink is empty. Oh, shucks. Like I got it. Like you immediately kind of take those social cues and change how you're, what you're talking about. You might change the direction of the conversation. Same thing with a presentation. If it's not working, if you're not connected with your audience, 
everyone's going to suffer the audience and the presenter. And at the end, you're going to be like, wow, this is, that was brutal. Yeah. When I used to train radio broadcasters, I would tell them, I'm like, you can't talk to everyone. When you try to talk to everyone, you talk to no one. That's the same with like products. If you try to design a product for everybody, you've done it for no one. So I will, there, there, I mean, I've taken public speaking courses when I was in undergrad. And one of the best pieces of advice was uh, the professor was a big baseball fan. He was the baseball coach where I went to school. And he said, pick somebody out at first base, shortstop, and left field. And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? And he's like, just find someone who has a, who makes eye contact at first base over here on the right side, shortstop over here on the left side, and then someone far away. He's like, so now it looks like you're looking at me, even if I'm not the person you're looking at, because you're gesturing over here. So just find those three people and explain it, whatever you're explaining, explain it to those three people, three. And if even if you're in a room full of 3,000, it will feel like you're explaining it to me, even if I'm not at first base, shortstop, or left field. Conversation is better than presentation, right? You even said the word lecture. I sell, I tell this to people all the time. Have you ever had someone use the phrase, uh, he was, I was getting lectured to in a good way. No, it's a negative connotation. Oh, it's getting this full on lecture about the grasshoppers and the, God, I couldn't even get out of there fast enough to get a vodka soda, but that's, the, that's how it works. So phrasing it as a conversation, it's just easier. Pretend as if you were to explain this to someone who has no idea what the hell you're talking about. And then you won't, the thing you'll do is you won't jump around as much. You won't skip big parts. You won't assume because you're like, I'm walking this one person from not understanding. I don't really know where they are because we're all in different levels of not understanding in the room. That's why we're in the room. And I'm going to go nice and slow. We're going to go from point confused to understanding real quick in a conversation. I'm going to add another piece to this. Yes, and me. You can't be afraid of your audience. Yeah. And you can't be afraid of participation or questions when you're having mm -hmm. a conversation because that's what makes it more of a conversation. And I really find that your audience will actually help you bring out the best in you. Yeah. Especially really if you are the expert in this area and it helps you check for understanding. It helps you kind of gauge whether um, the conversation is going the way you hoped it would. And it can bring up good points that maybe you hadn't thought of and yeah. then you can oh, yeah. elevate that. Yeah. I'll, I'll read and pivot. If if the people I'm looking at look confused, I'm like, I'm going to go back for a minute. That shows you have a mastery of the information. Again, I don't think you need to run through your presentation 62 times word for word. I think you need to understand the beats. Yes. Just like it, there, it's a, it's, it's, it's beginning, middle and end. We'll get, that's one of my suggestions too. It's coming up. I'll just say it now. Understand, structure your presentation, your, con your big old conversation, what's not, whatever you want to do as a have a beginning middle and end what i had a great professor in pt school jason craig who's irish did a cooler name like an accent i'm not gonna do it because it won't be good but he was like what so what now what like that's it that's all it is oh, so i kind of love that my presentation is given to researchers at csm this year and it's how do we explain science better science isn't finished until it's understood is the name of the presentation so i at first i'm going to explain the problem here is what I understand as the problem. This is the first, first act of a movie. There are things we need to agree on. And if we don't agree on the problem, you aren't going to like my solutions. Because if, if I'm giving you solutions to a problem that we don't think exists. So in movies, the idea is, do you, have you ever heard this phrase? Suspended disbelief? Mm -hmm. If you cannot have suspended disbelief that time travel is real, Back to the Future is going to suck for you. But if you're yeah. like, I can have suspended disbelief that aliens exist, then... Aliens is going to be a good movie. If you can't, it's going to suck. In presentation terms, this suspended disbelief really is we have to have an agreement. We have to be on the same page, right? The, the problem that we're here to, un, to solve and do not, I cannot o understate this. I cannot overstate this. I cannot overstate this. Um, saying the thing that the problem, stating the problem clearly, slowly at the beginning, is terribly important. People, this is context. This is the starting point. So I'm going to get up in front of in CSM in Boston in a few weeks, and I'm going to explain the problem how I see it. Now, my co-presenter is a researcher. Sheila Schindler Ivins is a straight up stereotypical researcher. She's going to talk about it from her point of view. Then I'm going to get up there and talk it in my point of view. We're both talking about the same thing, just in different ways. So my point of view is, uh, 
you're a researcher, your job is to get published, do do get get money, get a job, do science, get published. I'm here to tell you why that's not going to work in terms of because your goal is actually to get people to understand what you're saying. I'm here to tell you why your science doesn't spread. That's my starting. That's my starting point. Very clearly. I might say it seven different ways. Looking around at first base, shortstop and left field and and doing this. Are we in agreement? Is there anybody here who disagrees with that? I would love to hear from you. Now that does take you mentioned conversation with your audience. That takes some getting that's that's another level. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it can be scary because it's unexpected, oh, right? You never sure. know what somebody's gonna say. And uh, I think all of us who have presented at a conference have had that person who stands up and they then start to give their own presentation. And you're like, okay, um, I'm gonna redirect that and we're gonna get back on task here. But um I love the people yeah, I think that has happened. It's always the, I have a question and you're like, okay. And then they give a statement. Yeah. I'm like, I don't think you understand what a question is, but that's a different, that's a different soliloquy. Yes. So, um, so that was your suggestion, right? That was yours. Um, yeah. All right. Mine is a clear structure and flow beginning, middle, and understand the three act play that you're putting on because I need to understand the problem right? Now you're going to give me some solutions, right? And I need to understand what's going to happen if I take your solution, if I, if I go through the steps that you just laid out. This is communication to a presentation audience. This is communication to a spouse, a friend, a stranger, a patient, a business partner, beginning, middle, end. This is go-to. This is your alphabet. This is basics. So make sure you structure that presentation. And I'll go backwards before I go forwards. Do not begin structuring your presentation in PowerPoint. Even if you use PowerPoint, use it, whatever. Don't start there. Because it's very easy to be like, well, I need a slide for this, and I need a slide for this, and I need a slide for this. And then it becomes what Rebecca said first, which is, oh, now your presentation is the PowerPoint. Nope. Structure it on, I like Post-it notes or a dry erase board or three by five cards. I like it for dry erase board because I just all over the place. I also like it better for three by five cards because I can move them. I have to erase and rewrite with a dry erase board, three by five cards or uh, sticky notes. I can, the idea never moves. I can move it though. I'm a Google doc kind of girl. See, I don't use anything digital and I am a technology guy, but when I am doing ideas, I love a black Sharpie or a dry erase board. It's funny. I really do too. I mean, I've got like every color pen you can imagine. I have 18 color sticky notes here, but I type faster than I write. So I can get all of the like ideas out quicker and then I can pick them up and move them around. Uh, and if you're presenting with somebody, it can be a lot more collaborative. That oh, way. Yeah. I'm just saying the very first step I actually use, uh, I'll start with butcher paper. I'm actually pointing at it because it's off camera, like butcher paper because there's a roll of it and I can rip it and I don't feel bad. Um, but I, I, I draw pictures. A lot of times I don't even draw a word like or a word and then I'll draw a picture. Like, okay, like I have a dead raccoon on that butcher paper right now because I'm like, one of the things will be tell the story about the dead raccoon. Then I will flip to that slide and maybe it'll shock me because I haven't memorized my presentation. I've rehearsed it. I know it, but I've not memorized it word for word, which allows me to get off track and then get back on track. But when I see the slide of the dead raccoon, I go, oh, that's me. That's past me telling current me, tell the story about the dead raccoon. Put this context because that's where it goes in the story. I think so, you're going to need a social media graphic just of the dead raccoon. I've, I've given this slide before and it goes over well. I use silence too. Like I flip to that because not every slide is like a dead animal. That's a that's a jarring thing. And it's not gory, a little bit. But when it does, people, I want I I'm I, I use silence as a weapon. I stop talking. I want people being like to their name, like what the hell is that? And I'll just like sit there. Maybe I'll take a sip of water and I'll look at it. I'll nod. I'll look at them. I'll gesture to them. I'm like, where do you think I'm going with this? Because we pause naturally in talks. Like conversations. And yet when we do it with presentations, we feel like I need to be fire hosing these people because if I'm not talking, it means I don't know what I'm doing. And that's not true. You can pa I'm pause and breathe and and swallow and blink and do all those things. That's so interesting. I'm like thinking now about the presentation that I'm going to give at CSM. And part of it is like how to use a framework with specifically complex patient cases. And what I'm actually thinking now is like you've got... You've got the like one liner about the patient case. And I think the next slide should just be what the final diagnosis was. 
And then the process can be to work backwards there, right? So that you, but like pause on that final diagnosis and have people think, how the hell did we get from here? Oh, so you're going to do, to here. you're going to do beginning, end, pause, middle. How did we get to the, oh, that's kind of cool. See, human brains hate that. Uh, they in do. A, we, we, we don't like when we don't, when things don't make sense, when things are missing out, we're like, how did fill in the blank? That's a powerful tool. Brains hate yeah. that. It's itchy to a brain in a good way. But if I can get you to be like, okay, this is where we started and this is where we end, then hopefully your brain starts thinking about the framework that I've just shared with you. How do I use that and tool? you can start thinking, how the heck did we get here? That's and then great. if you use that framework, hopefully your brain's starting to fill in those pieces. And then I can tell you how we got there. And uh, you can see why it was important that we not skip the framework. Instead of me just saying, this is what I did next. This is what I did after that. And then we did right. this. Yeah. Matt Parker and Trey <laughs> Stone. Do you know those names? They're from Colorado. Uh, from Colorado. Those are the yeah. South Park guys. They just bought Casa Bonita. I don't know what that means, but it's it's house is, is, it a is it a Mexican restaurant? Yes. They have cliff, cliff divers. Okay. Oh, that's, there's, oh, okay. So yeah. those guys gave a talk. There's this viral clip that they had a while ago. And they said, if your show or car, they're like, how is South Park so successful? And you might love or hate South Park, right? They're like, it never lets you get balanced. Like, what do you mean? They were, they were doing this to film students. And they were like, a boring show would be this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. And they're like, no, you need to sort of not, human brings, beings, we like novelty. We like to not know. We like to be like, well, A, B, C. Okay, that's easy. Well, you're doing A, then C. What do you think the B is? And we're like, oh, I have to now think. And now I'm back in the room. So the South Park guys were like, this happens. And therefore, this happens. Not just this, then this. Therefore. And they were like, that was the change. Now they can walk into any show prep meeting for South Park. Because I barely, I doubt they're there every day now, 20 years later. Right? They're barely involved. They're just probably recording voices. Good for them. Um, but they were like, we can walk in and tell you exactly why this episode is not going to work if we spot this and then this and then this and then this. And then if you're a fan of Ferris Bueller and then Bueller, and then it starts to sound like Bueller and Bueller and Bueller. So don't have your presentation do that. And you can do that with something like Rebecca just demonstrated or a story will jar it up. I just explained something to you. We were talking earlier today about the Pareto principle, the 80 20 rule. So I could. Be like Ben Stein, who played the guy who said Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. I could just explain the 80-20 rule to you. A great way to make it stick would be then tell you a story or give you an anecdote or an example. Human, What did you want the most while you were studying for your NPTE? I wanted example questions. Yeah. Like I had a study book full of things. I wanted questions. Why? They're like... They're examples, they're stories, they're tests. That's ask a question. Do you want to know how I smell? I always sound like the smartest guy at a dinner party. Just ask questions, never answer them. What do you think about this? And then people, just, people they don't even know. They'll know. I'm doing it in plain sight. Take this trick, steal it. But human brain, uh, you're asking a question to get someone else to tell a story or tell like something. So ask questions during a presentation and then pause to let people think properly. Give them a hot second. I'll tell this is like a this is a not in my unmissable elements of captivating presentation, but if you think you're going slow enough, slow down by another 50%. Oh, I hate that. Stop. I'm no good at that. I can talk fast and I do talk fast. But when you want people to understand, which is the goal of why you got up there and you flew there. The goal is you got to slow down a little bit because you know what's coming next. You know it's A, then B, then C, then D. Slow it down. And the other thing with, in terms of pausing, this was a great visual. Here's my story on why pausing is so important. It's not just for dramatic effect. Did you see what I did there? People understand what you just said when you're not talking. So imagine, I mean, it's very obvious with like feeding a baby but they can only swallow what you just gave them when you're not shoveling more food in their mouth. Same applies for words in people's ears. So let them digest that for a hot second. It doesn't mean pause. 
or dramatic effect every 10 seconds. But slow it down. Like, they're smart people in the audience, but they're getting a fire. If people, you know, that fire hose analogy rings true a lot of the times. Slow it down. Put half as much information and you'll get 10 10 (laughs) extra results. I know, and I'm going to say a bad word. So if you have kids, earmuff it. My story for use ha- try to try to try to tell half as much, and you'll get you'll actually get more understanding. Don't put ten pounds of shit in a five pound bag. You can't. I know you can. You can put ten pounds of shit in a five pound bag. The bag is going to rip, or it's going to be distorted. I don't know why you're bagging shit anyway, but it's it's you can only do so much. TED talks are seventeen minutes. Yes. So. Take that for what it's worth. I think my presentation is like 90, but I'm going to need 20 because I'm not going to put 10 pounds of information in a five pound bag. I get that they're smart people, but we have limited bandwidth in our brain for getting stuff. And if you overload that, I learn not, not only do I not, it's like a glass. I'm not just losing the water that I'm spilling. Once the pint, I'm filling the pint, I'm filling the pint. And I keep going with the pitcher and it's spilling out and it's spilling out. I think with, our brains, that analogy isn't true because I think once you start to spill out, we lose everything. We're like, I don't know, I, don't know, I just, I'm overloaded, I'm done. I got nothing. No, nope, too much, too much, too much. So as soon as you hit that point, one ounce of information too much throws everything out and then you lose. Then it's binary. That's my, that's my opinion. Although there's probably science on that. That's a way to sound smart is, that's my opinion. It's probably science on it. You can go look for it. That's how I sound like Joe Rogan. So uh, mine is my I've I lost. Oh, have a clear have a clear structure and flow, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And how you get there is up to you. Use a Google Doc. I like Sharpies and three by five cards or butcher paper or dry erase boards. Do whatever. But don't start with PowerPoint. Please. Nope. Just don't start there. It's bad. All right. What's your next suggestion? Is this your last one? It is. My last one is gonna sound like super squishy. Um uh, but I'm gonna need you to just like be yourself. Because when you try to present like someone else, it doesn't really work. And I've also found that like, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to like be perfect. Being vulnerable is okay. If like something goes wrong, I think just acknowledging that and moving forward is good. Like if, if you don't know the answer, just being like, you know, I don't, I don't know. Let's talk about that. And I find that once I kind of stopped trying to present like I thought a presentation should go, yeah. and I started just being more myself, there are moments when I get emotional during presentations because maybe I remember the case or because I feel really strongly about that piece. And I, I want other people to feel that too. Or I'm sharing a struggle that I had in my story so that you can connect more with the point I'm trying to make. And that's okay too. So I've just sort of embraced the fact that sometimes I'm awkward. Sometimes I talk too fast. Sometimes maybe my joke doesn't land quite right. But overall, being myself seems to be more effective than pretending to be somebody that I'm not. A hundred percent. I don't know if I I could. I'm going to add a piece to it. Yes, and. The yes and is that imposter syndrome doesn't feel that bad when you're not trying to be someone else. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> because yeah. if you're being yourself, you're not an imposter. You're, you're imposter. you are owning yourself. You're owning owning everything about you. And that's mm. that's people are there to see you. So you Can know. I tell a story? No, we please. So, but it has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It does. So I this was a problem when I used to, to teach people to become radio broadcasters or when they would get to me from wherever they were. So I would call it, um, I would call it uh, headphone syndrome. And what I mean by that is like, and you can hear it now in this live stream is I have a pretty good microphone and I run it into a thing and it, my voice sounds different. It amplifies my voice, makes my voice sound pretty. Well, that when you're a radio broadcaster, you listen to headphones, right? You monitor because you need to listen to the caller or the music or whatever. And you can always hear yourself in a different way than you normally hear yourself. Mm -hmm. We hear ourselves through our skull, not from microphone to ear, right? So it's different. And also in radio, it amps it up. It's a good microphone. So what happens is it's this positive feedback loop in a negative way. I'll I'll explain what that means. 
when you hear yourself in a microphone for the first time and you're like, you know, you're introducing like Foo Fighters and you're saying something cool and then you hear how cool you are and you get try to get cooler and then it keeps happening. It's like you keep he, you, you keep hearing yourself sound like you're 10 feet tall and bulletproof and then you just keep going and it makes you hear more and you do more until you, who the hell is that? That's not, that's not you. It's right. not you. And the audience doesn't know what's going on. The audience has never heard of headphone syndrome, but they know this is not real. They're like, I don't know what this is, but this dude is just fake. He's faking when people are, when people are being something they're not, it's super obvious. I don't know what it is. I know if something's wrong. I don't like it. I'm not sticking around. So here's how I used to do the trick. You did have to use headphones, right? You had to monitor it. I would have them, I would say, take one out. Because now I can still monitor in one ear, but I can hear myself in the room how I really speak. And I'm using a story about the actual tone of your voice to make sure you don't sound like you're doing a Bigfoot, you know, tractor, you know, monster truck commercial. But it really also is what you're saying. If you get on stage... And you get like that. And I know PTs do. It's not just PTs. It's anybody. You get up there and you were tapped. You were asked by colleagues in your profession to be an expert on this. And you get up there and you button that button so tight and high. And you tighten the tie. And now you're using words like pontificate. And you're gesturing. And you're sounding like you're the smartest man in the world. I Using the biggest words does not mean you're smart. And using accessible words does not mean you are not intelligent. In fact, I would say the most intelligent people, I mean, Einstein said it. You can't, if you don't understand something, unless you can explain it simply. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it. So take a breath. Ask how you would explain this to a student or a colleague who already knew you. You don't need to be anybody else. You're more than good enough and enough that you don't need to put on any airs or sound like you're, you know, doing the new road, the new rodeos in town. And we've got, you know, Buck Wild. He's the cowboy killer. Buck Wild. You know, you don't need to do that in any context. So, yeah, I'm going to yes and your yes and, which is just be you. I think, I think that's just the only way to go. You can't screw that up. I think embracing, if something goes sideways, I actually get real calm. I'm like, oh, something screwed up. Good. I'm not perfect now. Great. I never was yes. gonna be, but I'm like, great. All right, we got the, we got the dirt on the uniform early. All right, good. Now we know. Now we know where the where Murphy's Law is showing up. So I think that's great. Was that your third one? That was my third one. So it's your okay. turn. Um, mm, mm, mm. I have two. I'll put them together. One because you already said, which was visual impact, impact and simplicity. Uh, mm -hmm. If a picture is worth a thousand words. I'll let you use one picture per slide. That's pretty good. Yeah. Two pictures per slide. It's confusing. Unless they go together. Like a, a picture of a dead raccoon tells a story. Tells me a story to use. So visual simplicity, right? When clip art came around and different fonts and transitions and swooshes, and we can use a video on every slide. I would say like, so the way to figure this out or figure out if you're doing it right is nice versus need. So I had a professor in PT school or in uh, in journalism communication school who said, if you you can put words on a slide, you can put uh, seven. Because I think he said that was the max number we could read off a billboard at 60 miles an hour, seven words before we crashed our car. You know, He probably just made that up. But it was like, you can put seven words on a slide when you give a presentation in my class. Every word after that is a dollar and it doubles. So the eighth word is a dollar. The ninth word is three dollars because the first word is two and the second word is doubled it now. Oh, sorry, the first word is one dollar, the second word is two dollars. So he's like, You can do you can do you put as many words as you want in there. You owe me money though. And he's I like, think if we if we do that math, we could pay for everybody to go to CSM for free. Holy crap. We could all yeah. go for free. Everybody would go for presenters would go home poor though, because you'd pay for it. So visual simplicity. That you know, that sort of reiterate what you were saying about your presentation. The slides aren't your presentation. You are you're the show, baby. I ain't there for the slides. And then the final thing is goes along with my clear structure and flow, beginning, middle, and end. Like, say what you're there to say. Uh, sorry, tell them what you're about to tell them. Hey, everybody, today I'm here to show you how to get a larger impact 
for your research beyond publish. Do you understand? That's the problem. And then beginning, middle, end. Um, leave it with a clear call to action. So the third thing is, let's review what you just did. Like a good professor. Hey, everybody, let's sum it up again. Remember what we just learned today? And you're like, oh, yeah, we did learn those three things, right? Brains love threes. Stooges, amigos, blind mice love threes. I'm, I'm doing begin, middle, end. That's it. And then I'm going to give a couple suggestions in the middle. Knowing that 98% of my audience ain't going to do it. I'm talking to the two people who are going to do it. That's what I'm doing. Do you want to give a nod to your presentation where you will employ these skills? Well, so I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. Ooh, so like that, that maybe you can help people problem solve this. I like helping people go. If you're presenting with a group of people mm. and you don't share the same presentation styles or philosophies. Okay. I would like your tips and tricks for how to make that presentation still feel seamless and connected and can, not disjointed or like yeah. a piecemeal. It, practice. So I get scared when I do a live stream or an interview or a panel. Panels freak me out. They don't, they don't make me scared. They just make me go like, do you understand that this is like getting... I'm, I've never a dancer or a performer. I'm like, this is, let's say it again, a presentation. A play is a presentation. That's super, super, super scripted though. That's why you can have 12 people on stage at a, at a, at a play. So I would say, I hate, you're going to hate my answer, which is you got to practice. You got to organize. You got to coordinate. You got to talk to each other. Does not need to be down to the second and down to the word. Does not mean to be scripted. But when I do when I do panel discussions, I do not wing it. I'm like, so here's how I feel this flow. And I just want you to know, if I feel like you're done, I'm going to move to the next person. If you don't have something to say, you can just touch your nose and I'll, I'll skip you. There's no need for me to come to you. So I prepare with these people. We have signals and codes. But it's, 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 more, for the, it's more for the audience and to make the guest, the, the presenter or the, the guest I'm talking with feel better. So if you're talking with a bunch of people and it's disjointed, that's okay. That'll sound like three different people giving three different acts. But you got to know that. Otherwise, it'll sound like if you have three acts and they have three acts and they have three acts, that's nine acts. And I'm not even a math major. So coordination is key. Get together. I think that makes sense. Yeah. it's The more people you add to a presentation or a panel, it's not adding in my mind. It's multiplying the, the amount of changing styles. The audience, we can tolerate a little bit of jumping around, but when that's happening, I don't know how to get comfortable again. So I minimize that as much as possible. I, for me, like what we do with um, some live streams, me plus two guests, two other people, that's a good amount. Two, uh, three's company, right? We said this before. Ha ha. Uh, two's company, three's company, four's a crowd. Mm -hmm. How many? How many people are you presenting with? Three. You plus three? Nope. Total of three. The three's company. I think three is tolerable. I mean, that's why we have phone numbers like that. Because the brain likes chunks of information. And we like it in threes. So we do like area uh, zip, area code, yeah. mm -hmm. prefix. And then we do, so we do like three, three, seven. Or sorry, three, three, four. So the phone number is like seven. But that's, that's where our brain really maximally is. When I see a panel with like seven, you know, five people on it, I'm like, that's five speeches and that's hard yeah if i'm on a panel i want to go first yes you do you don't want to go last because the people are no. mentally fatigued by that all right so review yours was your presentation your slides are not your presentation yep slides mine are not was, my presentation mine was storytelling it's a great tactic it's a powerful weapon it's what our brains are wired for consider your presentation a conversation yeah it's a good one uh, structure, beginning, middle, end. How do you prepare it? Make sure it's clear. If you can't explain it simply, go back to that drawing board. And then yours was be yourself. No, oh, yeah, that's a good one. It really, it's so, and people are going to hear that and be like, that's a cop out. Not if you do it. Right. If you actually do it, it's simple, but not easy. Uh, cause, oh, because a presentation is an unnatural thing. If you're, if you're, if you can make it a conversation, like you're just talking to one person. I love here. Here's a great way to know if you're doing that. If you're saying something that you that you agree with and believe, and then you've already decided that 
you and the audience agree on the problem and you're giving a solution or something, if they start nodding with you, God, that is some, that's visual crack to me. That's like, yes. We okay. Are. But when I'm an audience member and the person in front of me is nodding the whole time, I'm like, stop it. I don't mean nodding. Like your head's going to fall off. I mean, like if I hit a question, if I'm like, what, like, don't you agree that if you want this, but you don't do it, you shouldn't be mad if you don't get it. And I'll start acting like a preschool teacher. Like, like, do we agree? And I'm not looking for everybody in the audience to nod, but if I can get that one person to at least lock eyes. Although the funny thing is, as a presenter, um, when people are listening and processing information, we don't understand that we have like listening and like, you know, what RBF is, right? Oh, I have that. Do you? No, you don't. You don't have RBF. I've been told I do. All right. Well, that person sucks. So <laughs> but, but we have this facial expression. I have it. Everybody does. We have our own resting learning face. And yeah. you have to understand that it's not that person giving you like boredom. Sometimes, like we're listening in our whole face, our bodies, we're relaxed, we're in it, we're absorbing this. And so, as a presenter, don't take what you're seeing, um, take it with a grain of salt. It, they are they're more engaged sometimes than the facial expression would allow. It's so true because there are sometimes I'll be giving a presentation and I'll look at somebody and I'm like, oh god, like oh, and I'm like, like the entire time, I'm sure they're not paying attention they hate right. me they hate the presentation and then they're the one that comes up at the end and they were like oh my, oh my gosh God. your presentation look, changed my life and i'm like you look, oh, okay because really? you look like I was your scared. face made me really scared right. the entire time so know that know that understand that i do that that's why i look for one i look for the people who are like yeah, there's all these people we have these people in our lives i look for the people who have the resting excited face R E F resting excited face. And I'm like, let's just, cause my brain's dumb too. If I see an excited face, I get excited. And the more I get excited, the more they get excited. So I look for the super excited people, the people who've had a cup of coffee or two before my presentation. Um, when is your presentation? Put some butts in seats. I don't think uh, people so promote their presentations at CSM enough. So do that. I am presenting with two great teams of people. Um, mm -hmm. So thurs Thursday, Thursday, February 15th at 11 a.m. That's like a total sweet spot. You have plenty of yeah. time to get your coffee. And I'll be presenting with Dr. Jenna Seagraves, Dr. Mark Magdaleno, who are both emergency PTs. And we are presenting on how to manage the most complex patients in the emergency department, but how to make that simple so it doesn't feel so hard. Yes. And then Friday, or no, Saturday, Jeez, I don't even know. Saturday morning at 11 a.m., I'm going to be presenting with Dr. Helena Esmond and Dr. Katie johnston Sype, and we're going to be talking about dizziness. So spin doctors, differential diagnosis of dizziness in the emergency department. If Again, if you don't play a little bit of list, Little Miss Can't Be Wrong at the beginning of the presentation, just hold the phone to the thing because you already called it spin doctors. You have to play with it. That's how we're going to like establish our expertise. Little Miss, Little Miss, Little Miss Can't Be Wrong. There's three of us. There you go. The Olsen Blues, that's one of their non-radio hits, Spin Doctors, was my first concert ever, by the way, at the Orange County Speedway. You know, okay, you I kind of have you beat. Well, who my was first concert, The Grateful Dead, but Sting yeah. was the opener. That sets the bar too high. Like, there's nowhere to go there. Where are you going to go after The Grateful Dead? Uh, my presentation is also on Thursday, February 15th. Mine is more the happy hour uh, time, three to five. I'm with Sheila Schindler-Ivins, who's a straight up researcher she's like i'm a researcher and it's in the academy of research and the presentation is called science isn't finished until it's understood effective strategies for communicating rehab research to the public so you're going to hear from sheila who's going to be like hey listen here's how research works right everybody agrees this is how research works and then we're going to show like why it doesn't disseminate and why it's not translated and i'm going to go because you don't have any media but i'm going to show you how to do it too I'll, simple stuff simple 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 ways to do it I'll also give away, I don't know if I've ever given this resource away before, there is a very powerful we, uh, website that you can use to answer all of your science communication questions. Have you ever been to it? Tell me. It's called Google. Ooh. Google. Listen, there. I mean, but I'll, I'll, I'll get into deeper why we don't do that and also researchers aren't incentivized. In a, in, a, in a defense of them, they're not incentivized to actually go beyond publish. The game is just not set up to run past the end zone for them. So anyway, I hope that some of these were helpful. I hope that some of you, because we're coming into conference season, might take one or two of these and employ them. Uh, and I, I, I stand by that offer I made earlier, which is if you'd like to have a free 
presentation review, master review. I'll bring in some other people and we'll say, we'll give you a couple points. We'll fix the super easy stuff. Although I'll tell you, I would have I would have some people do this in a previous job and they would come to me like two days before and be like, what do you think of this? And I'm like, oh, I would change this and this and this. And they're like, it's too late. I can't change any of it. I'm like, then why'd you ask? Why, why do we ask? Don't ask. But um, I'm excited for this CSM. It's been a while. It's been almost a year, exactly a year since CSM in San Diego. So I'm looking forward to it. All right. Um, they say the best conversations happen at happy hour. Uh, thanks for coming to ours. Wow. <laughs>